Because the human subject is caught between ideas of entropy and circularity, it is always in need of both psychoanalysis and architecture. With psychoanalysis, we learn that repetition can be both fearful and comforting, and, in the analytical session, we are encouraged to free associate our thoughts to relax this difference between comfort and fear. The analyst also has to develop a way of listening that reconfigures the usual functions of repetition, an art called free-floating attention. This video attempts to show how these relaxed speaking and listening styles involve an architecture that bridges between a 2-pi system that makes coincidences appear to be inexplicable and a 4-pi or double-circuit system that sees coincidence as necessary. Although the subject trapped by processes that diverge, it can also be liberated by an instrumentality that, paradoxically and inexplicably, converges. To make this claim about mappability, we have to use the same topological thinking that Lacan used in his middle seminars. The essence of this topology was that the observable Euclidean world strives to complete its circuits and conserve its energies in a 2-pi or flat way. But the reality it lives in is more like a 4-pi circuit, where for every single rotation at the level of the symbolic, there is a double rotation in the real. The symbolic can't cover everything. It has holes and gaps, where the real breaks through to create situations that are what, in topology, is called non-orientation. Instead of one thing rotating 720 degrees, you get two things rotating in 360 degrees, like the Roman gods, the mortal caster and the immortal parlox, taking turns being dead and alive. In the 2 pi realm, non-orientation produces a binary logic, contradictions, and paradoxes. For the human subject, it produces symptoms, such as compulsion, or emotions such as fear or actions ranging from aggression to humiliation. We could pretend that the 4pi realm didn't exist, but we would continue to map to it from our 2pi world on Earth. Looking upward to the sky, we would imagine that our fate is held by the stars, whose sidereal truth of structure, patterns configurations, we call houses in heaven. Houses that rotate in predictable ways. So we celebrate the repetition of these celestial houses and their predictable desires that we, who are down on earth, codify as myths, where coincidence and retroaction can only be seen with astonishment, if not fear. Therefore, we who inhabit the 2 pi world take solace when we see the heaven seem to perform the same tricks with time and motion that, on earth, would create chaos. The procession of the planets between earth and sun allow us to blame our earthly woes on heaven's incongruities, just as residents of Mediterranean lands blame their troubles on the hot wind from Africa. We like to think that our human discomforts and self-imposed problems are 4 pi, the result of structure, rather than 2 pi, our own error. So, the unconscious is put on the side of the 4 pi and given over to the gods of hell and paradise. Their logic is to be found, like the logic of science, in demonstrations of a structure that, like the physicist Paul Dirac's belt trick, shows how we think in the language of 2 pi but we act out and have emotions according to a 4 pi logic. You can do the belt trick for yourself. If the buckle and tongue of a belt are held in the same orientation, you can twist the belt a full circle, or 2 pi, but you can't get rid of the twist. Paradoxically, if you twist it another full circle, the resulting 4 pi twist disappears if you move the buckle over and around the tongue. The belt demonstrates the difference between two programs, one that diverges into a multiplicity of problems, another that converges on a hidden solution where the belt goes from doubly twisted to perfectly flat. We suppress the fact that we live a double life, one in the space suggested by the R schema that is linear and anxiety-based, and another that is a space-time of rotation where we seem to be offered a magical solution. This depends on the ability to move past the first program represented by the Mobius band's non-orientation and into the flatness of the space of rotation. In the L schema, Dirac's belt creates a new option for subjectivity, 
a chance for the real of the unconscious to slip past the barrier of the imaginary and return to its point of origin. Is this not what Lacan means to show by calling this final goal the S and giving it the position of the Greek letter, phi? Isn't he saying that we are answering Freud's enigmatic challenge, that where the S has been, is the place where I shall be? If your head starts to hurt thinking about twisting the belt used to explain quantum physics, you might be relieved to know that the idea of a first and second program has already been translated into popular culture. Stanley Kubrick's 1968 film, 2001, A Space Odyssey, is about a mission to connect Earth to other intelligent life. What the astronauts and their planners don't know is that this life is not some alternative life form on some other planet, but something implicit within their own phylogenesis. The second program seems to know how to translate phylogenesis, the development of the species, into the ontogenetic transformation of the human individual, from abstract subjectivity to a materiality in Lacanian terms. Or, as we learn at the end of the movie, from a language-based idea of reality into a kind of lithic or crystalline real. To activate the second program, Hell cannot be seen to be in control of things. He has to convince the astronauts to shut him down, and he does this by killing off the crew who are in suspended animation, one by one, until they decide that Hal is a killer who must be stopped. This allows the mission to move from the first program, which Hal knows is doomed to fail, to a second program, where Hal is able to connect with the mysterious obelisk we have seen in the first of the film, as a lithological prime cause of human subjectivity. What is amazing about Kubrick's film is that he seems to understand how a mapping process plays the key role. It's as if he has Lacan's diagrams on his desk at the moment he is storyboarding the scene. We see the last surviving astronaut, Dave Bowman, in a weird, brightly lit room with furniture and classical artwork. He finds that dinner has been set out for him. Inexplicably, Bowman finds that he is not alone, or rather, more inexplicably, that the other person in the room with him is himself, an older, dying version. This is nothing less than Lacan's concept of between the two deaths, the interval between a literal death and a more conclusive symbolic death. All cultures have some version of this, based on the process of the desiccation of the corpse, but in this film, desiccation takes the form of a fluid transformation, from an entropic flow to a convergent maelstrom that sucks Bowman into a vortex he both fears and desires. In the process, fear is converted to desire, a sidereal goal represented by the letter, S, the unbarred subject, and the place to which the unconscious wishes to return. We begin to catch on to what's happening when we see, in the distance, that the paintings are nativity scenes. We then know that the dying man is pointing to something that will make his death into a kind of rebirth. The monolith we saw at the opening of the film has returned. It is like a large screen TV for the dying man to stream a cosmic channel, a kind of ultimate viewing experience. From the bed angle, the monolith presents its screen function in the form of a black hole, a rectangular formatting of the OJR. We know from the L and our schemas that this is the S, or origin point, and that we are in the spherical space of rotation, where the 4 pi twist is going to flatten out our belt and return us to a pre-subjective state. In other words, we are headed for our own rebirth, a reincarnation. Just as the Italian philosopher Giambattista Vico argued, anticipating Freud, the individual and the species are mirrors of each other. They are cyclical. The species ages, deteriorates, and then is replaced by a new society. The individual grows older and returns to a moment of conception, but this is not the literal transformation shown in the film, but the moment when the unconscious breaks through the barrier of the two pi imaginary, the Euclidean single circuit made out of points, lines and planes, in other words, perspectival relationships. To see this more clearly, let's quickly run through this sequence of scenes. 
the single occupancy room with dinner service is interrupted by the accident of the falling wine glass. The broken glass seems to have a magical optical effect. It multiplies the astronaut into himself and his double, who is dying. We then see the monolith from a side angle, in relation to the bed and dying man. Then, we pivot to the dying man's point of view, to see the monolith face to face, not as a stone but as an ocular black hole, which has become a portal to rebirth. In review, we find an amazing creation of what seems to be a cinematic version of a Lacanian mathème. The lone surviving astronaut, Dave, goes through a process of rebirth, which seems to correlate to the circuit of the L schema, at its last critical step towards instrumental convergence on the point of the S, a return to the origin point in the space of rotation. 2 pi plus 2 pi equals 4 pi. The main clue comes between Dave's solitude and his discovery of his aged double, lying in bed. As he is eating the mysteriously provided dinner, he accidentally knocks the wine glass off the table. This breakage causes him to realize the non-orientable situation with his double. Then this non-conformity becomes the effective cause of the sudden presence of the monolith that seems to be the regulating force of the film. It is a kind of void that is both a center and periphery. As the camera rotates our view from the side to a face-to-face -face position, we begin to understand what this face-to-face -face means. It is the ability to return to the orientable condition that the unconscious must take with respect to the S. This takes place as the vector in rotational space completes its final journey to the origin. What appears to be impossible in Euclidean space becomes possible topologically. We can't observe it, but we can map it. This seems to be the rule for the unconscious as it speaks the language of Lelang. Where A and A' prime were non-orientable in ordinary space, they become orientable in the unbarred original condition of the subject, the pure S. This final step through the void of the monolith seems to give us permission to add to the L schema and R schema, Lacan's most famous graphic square. In seminars 13 and 14, Lacan used the fundamental polygon of the torus to model a negative interpretation of Descartes saying, I think therefore I am. This was to emphasize the symmetrical difference embedded in the fact that thinking and being are at loggerheads, that speaking and being are actually opposites. By labeling this upper right corner as repetition, Lacan called attention to the inner division in repetition itself, a division between linear experience, where repetition is the exception, and our contrasting cyclical mentality, where repetition is the foundational principle. There are two aspects of repetition that we know very well. On one hand, we are comforted by the idea of the circle. We need to see that every holiday will be a return to the same rituals, that it is no coincidence that every Friday will be an occasion to say thank God, and every Monday, as the blues song says, will be stormy. But, in our linear idea of time, just the reverse is true. Repetition is the expectation that effects will follow causes and in turn be the causes of other effects. Coincidences surprise us, and cases of deja vu and retroaction totally astound us. Where the linear idea holds fast to entropy and views any exceptions to its logic as miraculous, the cyclic idea of time believes that there is nothing new under the sun, and that everything is just a repeat performance. The fundamental polygon of the torus combines the L schema and R schema to show how the opposition of the little a and a', prime, which Lacan labels as the imaginary, form a barrier between the unconscious as the unbarred S. This is the ability to think something specific without thinking anything secondary about it. This is a specificity belonging only to the subject before the mirror stage. We can go further if we follow Lacan's advice on the corner marked with the Roman numeral 3. It is related to Vorstellung's representans, the condition of language as pure meaningfulness, after all the conventional meanings have been subtracted. 
It is therefore key to the idea of Lelang, Lacan's coined term for the language of the unconscious. The unconscious is compared to the individual trapped inside the symbolic and raging to get out by means of a reappropriation of language's basic machinery, without taking into consideration its intended products. Lacan here has in mind the rap man, who called his father a lamp, a towel, a plate. It is the dog that goes, meow, and the cat that goes, bow wow. The corners marked by the S at the upper left corner and the unconscious diagonally opposite are products of a divergence driven by repetition as simultaneously a linear idea, where coincidence is horrific or magical, and a circular idea, where repetition is the goal. At the lower left, the corner of the little a is, in contrast, the position of convergence, where the S and the unconscious are revealed to be symmetrical but different. This is the meaning of the Euler circles and the minus phi that Lacan uses to indicate the relation of union without intersection. Just as the astronaut has to break a glass to see his double dying in bed, the subject at the lower left corner of the fundamental polygon has to break speech into two parts. One part is the act. The other part is the content. By making these two parts non-orientable, the corners 2 and 3 can converge. This happens instrumentally, without any influence of intention or wish. Pure passivity allows the unconscious to defeat the barrier of the imaginary and step into the obsidian hole of the monolith. We could call this move, in appreciation for its geological origins, a crystal gate, a passage into a faceted jewel. It is the return of the 4pi vector to the zero point. We have only to add the labels for pi and 2 pi to indicate how the components of symmetrical difference aid and abed instrumental convergence. This forces us to consider how much this conclusive element of Lacan's fundamental polygon is actually the space of rotation, how much this space of rotation is the space of Lalang, how much the content of language and the act of language are the reasons we structure our material experience within a horizon that, although it is located at infinity, is as local as the ploughed furrow of Romulus. If the torus is the model of our desire, it is because it sees, in repetition, this double impulse, and the fact that demand takes form in a spiral that is simultaneously an inside and an outside. Here, Lacan is close to repeating Kant's poetic formula of the starry sky above and moral law within. It is not that these seemingly antithetical domains are also vectors pointing up and down, out and in, but the amazing realization that vectors can, simply by pointing and turning, encompass language within a sphere. The big difference with Lacan is that he knows precisely, and all too well, how Kant's sphere has a hole in it.